Hey everyone, it's Lisa with Are You My Cousin? It's time for our Thursday afternoon chat about genealogy. If you have, if we haven't met before, I'm Lisa Listen with the website Are You My Cousin? And I do like to come every Thursday afternoon to chat about all topics genealogy. And today, while um, you're coming in, if you don't mind just popping in where you're, where you're watching from, um, it just lets me know that you can see me, you can hear everything just fine. Um, I am coming to you from North Carolina. So it's a very, it's a beautiful summer day, but although the hot and humidity, the heat and humidity are definitely here for the summer, but it's still, it's a gorgeous day outside. Um, so I hope you're having great weather where you are. So today's topic was originally going to be about finding more clues inside those family photos. But guys, I have to tell you, and I apologize ahead of time, I have switched up the topic because I felt like as I was preparing that I needed I needed something more there, and that there was still a piece of that that I wanted to um, explore a little bit more before I actually talked with you guys about it. So we're going to talk about that next week. Oh, I'm sorry, next two weeks from now. And we will cover that topic definitely, but I have changed our topic up just a bit. And so what we're we going to talk about today is debunking family stories and how to do that. And I'm really excited about this topic, actually. It should be a really fun time to be able to, um, I want to kind of let you inside my head, my brain, how I think when it comes to finding troublesome ancestors and trying to figure out those crazy stories that we all get, right? That we find um, that come down, handed down to us. So anyway, that's what we're going to talk about today. Hey, Kelly, it's good to see you from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Hey, Cooper from the Northwest and Kim from Ohio. Yay. Hey, Diane from the hot Midwest. I have heard the Midwest was very hot this week. Definitely. And Tammy from Springfield. We finally got a little, a little break in the heat. We were in the humidity this week, but it's still pretty warm out there. But it is June in the South, too, so we're kind of used to it, actually. But anyway, all right. So what's happening over at Are You My Cousin this week? Well, lots of different things are happening behind the scenes for some upcoming things later on this summer. But the probably the most, the quickest thing coming up on the website is the new masterclass that the registration is open for. It is how to search for your ancestors' date of death even when you can't find a birth certificate or a certificate, some type of certificate of birth. Um, because quite frankly, most of our ancestors probably didn't have one. So that is going to be on June 22nd. So that's coming up pretty quickly and it's going to be at 1 p.m. And I'm going to pop the link into the chat here. And if you're watching on replay, I'll make sure I have that, that link down in the chat for you as well. That is, um, what did I do there? Okay, I think I got it. I don't know what that last one was. Hang on one second, guys. Something messed up on that one. Ah. All right, hang on. Let me, I think it works there. So anyway, back to that. So what that is, it's going to be kind of a 90-ish minute masterclass. It will be live. And it's everything I know about how to find a birth date or to narrow down that birth year for your ancestors. So it's online, it's offline. It's a lot of kind of thinking outside of the box type of things as well. And so I'll, I'll get you'll have also a very complete handout with that. So you can go back and review that later. If you cannot watch live for that, if you're not available next Tuesday, I think it's Tuesday, the 22nd, then don't worry about it. You you'll get everybody who registers gets a link to the replay and the handout. So you can always go back and watch it at your convenience if you're not able to stay for the whole time or you can't, if you're not available that day, but you to get that link at that price, you have to get, go ahead and register before the 22nd. So that's coming up. And so head over there, you know, when this is done, if you're interested to learn more about that, see if it might fit your needs. Hey, Danny, it's good to see you from Ohio. Okay. No. Oh, and Tracy's here from Oklahoma. Yay. All right. So if you're just coming in, I was uh, saying earlier that, I know you're coming in to hear about photographs, but because I felt like that, I just felt like I needed something more for that um, that talk with you guys that I have decided to postpone it and um, do that in a couple weeks. So today we're actually going to talk about debunking some of the family stories 
because I have a lot to debunk, that is for sure. And I think many of us do. And so I wanted to talk about that and, and kind of get let you into my process and my my thinking when I when I start to debunk family mysteries as well. So I will be using an example of one of my Irish ancestors, but guys, this applies across the board to any family mystery that you might have or any story that you're trying to debunk. All right, so I think that's, um, yeah, that's what's happening over here at um, Are You My Cousin this week. I've just been doing a lot of behind the scenes things, which I do a lot in the summertime to try to get things updated on the website and get things planned out for the future. Um, and these a little bit slower summer months, I kind of get back into the behind the scenes kind of thing. So if you don't see me, I'm still around. I'm just a little behind the scenes. Okay, let's talk about some oral history. Let's talk about some family stories and let's figure out why they're true or not true. Now, oral history is absolutely one of my favorite things. I don't talk about it as much on probably on the website as I really probably should because it is, I think, extremely important to our genealogy research. But when it comes to oral history and oral story, family stories, you know, we get a lot of um, which seem they seem kind of far fetched sometimes. Right. I, I know mine do sometimes. And we don't certainly oral history is not always accurate as it gets passed down from generation to generation. But what about some of those stories that tell you about those more distant ancestors? And how do you know what's true and what's not true from those stories? Because there's really nobody left to go to and talk to and question and say, hey, are you sure? Is that what they really did? Because there's it's just so, so many generations back. So the example I'm going to use, and you guys have heard me talk about my ancestor, Joanna. She's my third great grandmother. She was born in Ireland and showed up in Virginia. I'm sorry, she showed up in North Carolina in the foothills of the mountains. And I have no idea why. She's the only Irish born um, person on the census records there in 1860. She came in early 1850s. So the family story was that Joanna was married in Ireland, that they left Ireland to come to America, that her husband died on the way over, and she was pregnant. So she was pregnant. They came over. They were coming over. Her husband died on the ship over and they landed in America. She landed in America and had the baby once she got here. Now, the other piece of that puzzle is story is that her husband, when her husband died, she decided to put, to put him in a pickle barrel and preserve him for the rest of the journey over. I don't know what they thought she was going to do with him when, he, when she got here. Some say it's a pickle barrel and some say it's a whiskey barrel. Guys, that is the only variation in that story on two to two or three sides of our family. So that story comes down multiple family lines, but it's always consistent. One of the most, more consistent stories that I've heard, which kind of surprises me because, you know, we get a lot of variations. The only variation is whether it was a pickle barrel or whether it was a whiskey barrel. So, um, kind of crazy. You know? and, and this has been believed for, I mean, it is. Yeah. You just didn't argue with, with the elders on this one. This was, this is exactly who she was and what she did. So I thought, okay. Um, yeah, that sounds kind of crazy. <laughs> fast forward a number of years. Yes. Cindy, a pickle barrel, right? Really? Um, fast forward a couple of years. I actually, or a number of years, I actually last year, right before COVID hit at my last speaking engagement, met a woman who came up to me and said, I know who you, I know your brick wall ancestor, Joanna. Um, I know about her. And I was like, you're kidding me. So anyway, long story short, she put, she helped me get connect with an uncle, one of her uncles who knew her. And we learned a little bit more about um, Joanna. Not this, not going to get me too far, but the two things I learned, she's kind of a tiny woman, wasn't very tall. When, and I th we actually think we have a photograph of her, but she was not very tall. She was a fairly small framed woman and that she could cuss like a sailor. I'm like, okay. All right. Let's go. <laughs> now that that was interesting. Don't want to cross her. So then I got to thinking, I thought, I am going to solve the mystery of Joanna. I am going to figure out where she came from and who her parents were. Now I knew she came from Ireland. That was it. Guys, for that entire story that came through, we believe 
or I believe that the only piece of that puzzle is that she came from Ireland. I think that's the only piece that's true out of that entire story is that she was um, from Ireland. Now, what did I do with this? What did I do with this story? And I've, I've been working on Joanna for a long time. So the first thing I thought I did when it came to thinking about and trying to break down this brick wall and see if there's anything in this story that I could use, I could substantiate that she was from Ireland. I had enough records from census records to her um, to her tombstone to um I even found a um, a death record, a newspaper thing from the, um, not a newspaper, a church record that indicated she was from Ireland. So that I had good. I, I, I was like, yes, okay, we're, we're, okay, that part is true. So we know she's Irish. And we know that her daughter, remember, she came over, she was supposedly pregnant when she came over, was born in 1852. Now, the, the only problem is, I think she came over in the 18, late 1850, early 1851. So the numbers really weren't matching up there, but I thought, okay, I'll just kind of keep that in the back of my mind and, and keep moving forward on this. So I got to thinking, what happens? What is it about an Irish woman? How could she come in likely through New York, maybe through Baltimore and end up in the foothills of North Carolina? Guys, that's not an easy journey. To, from any either place to land in Surrey County, North Carolina. Why? Why did she end up there? There's no she's there's no Catholic um, church in the area there. So she I wasn't sure if she was Catholic or not. There were no other Irish folk in the area. So why there? What was what was going on? So recently I attended a lecture from one of the women up in the um, ACPL on Irish, female Irish immigrants. And she got me to thinking, I really needed to know not just about what an Irish woman did when she, her feet hit America, what happened to her. I needed to know who she was before she came over. Now, no, I can't find the records for Joanna at this point, but I needed to understand what was life like for a typical Irish female immigrant coming over to America in the 18, late 1840s, early 1850s. So kind of a kind of stepping back and getting that broader picture of what was that, what was that woman, what did she look like? So typically when Irish, female Irish ancestors immigrated over from Ireland, they typically were single. Typically in Ireland, back in Ireland, if they stayed in Ireland, they married relatively late. So, I mean, it was not unusual for them to be married, to stay single until late 20s, early 30s. That was not unusual. Then if they came over, they also very likely stayed single for a while. And the reason is when they came over to America, they would earn money. So they got jobs and they would earn money and they would send the money back home. Now the females were oftentimes more likely to send it from what they were telling me than the male immigrants, but the Irish female immigrant would send it back and likely she was helping support either to bring over another sibling, to bring over a niece or a nephew, to bring over another family member, or just to simply help the family out back in Ireland. But when she got married over in America, you know, typically she stopped working and the funds didn't go back. So she had a financial reason to actually not get married. So there was this economic reason not to get married so that she could continue to send money back. I thought, okay. So, and, and, and those who were still in Ireland, the, the single women, they stayed single. Again, they could work, they, um, the dire, the dowry was very expensive, so they might stay single for those reasons. So they would come over and hit America's shore. So, so my first thought in my head is I have this 25-year-old who is coming over from Ireland. She doesn't, she could have been married and pregnant, but it doesn't fit the typical picture. So I'm like, okay, well, let's take this further. So say Joanna was single and she gets to America, what then? 
what happens when a young single female ancestor female Irish immigrant lands on the American soil. Likely she came through um, New York, but she po she potentially could have come through Baltimore. So I have to think, well, was it cheaper for her to come in through New York or was it cheaper for her to sail into Baltimore? I'm still sorting that one out just a bit, but that but th that impacts her economic, economic situation, impacts where she might have come in at because she could have then come down. Now, when these immigrants would land on the American sh shore. So she predates Castle Garden, but she, um, but you know, if your ancestor ended up at Ellis Island, if they came in through New Orleans, if they came in through Baltimore, think about young, uh, young women coming in They're alone. Maybe it's a couple of them together. You land on that shore and who knows what's going to happen to you. You've got all kinds. They were just ripe for falling in victims to scams, to, anything. So there were societies, there were aid societies that started up and would be at the docks when the ships would come in in order to kind of help the Irish immigrants along, to help any of the immigrants come along. So each, you might have them off of many ethnic, ethnic groups would have their own aid societies. So and again, we're just using Irish as an example today, but like there might be the Hibernian Society. Um, I know in 1850 in New Orleans, the Hibernian Society got the police, New Orleans police, to put a couple policemen down at the docks for when these ships would come in and these young girls would come off so that they would um, be safe and, and could make their way appropriately. So they would do things like that. They would, some of them would help Im immigrants decide where to go. Maybe they knew that they had family in another state and they would help them get um, shuttled off and into that direction, to the right direction. They would feed them. They could help them in a variety of ways. Unfortunately, many of these were not funded well. And so they oftentimes maybe weren't able to help as many as there were certainly, that certainly needed it. But they were there. And there are some out there, particularly with the Irish population, that have records available. So there are still records out there to available. You can um, you can Google, you know, like Irish Aid Societies, 1850s, New York, um, or Hibernian Societies, New York, 1850s. That type of search would help you out. So Aid Society, I thought, okay, that's great. That gives me one avenue to look at is to, are Aid Societies. I thought that works. Now, the other thing that I had to think about for her was when my ancestor landed in America, and she at some point had to make her way. Maybe she was pregnant. If the family history holds true and she was indeed pregnant, what did a pregnant woman do when she hit the shores? Did she Was she with somebody else? Who would her support system have been? Because as wonderful as it was to have an aid society, oftentimes it was just local support for each other. That was their support system. And that was the key. I thought, OK, that's it. I've got to find the support system. Who brought her over? Why did she come over? And who came after her? So what we have found out is that nobody came after her. So I, I don't have to worry that she, she might. Sounds like she was probably one of the last ones to come over from her family if it was a chained migration. And I had to think about her faith. You know, we've talked a lot of times about is faith important to your ancestor? Because if it was, it's important to you. Typically, during the famine, I mean, these were... Catholic immigrants coming over. These were Catholic men and women who were coming over. And she ended up in an area where there was no Catholic group, no Catholic church. I don't even know if there is one today, actually. Um, it, there's just, that's just not an area where you would find many Catholics, more Protestant, more small ind independent type churches. But then I had, I had a thought. There's one other faith that's over there that's in that area that is also in Ireland, and that is the Quaker faith. So now I have a, I can start to make some, maybe possibly make some inroads to see, was this, was she a Quaker before she came to America? So it gives me another idea of looking at, typically faith would have been important. It was later in her life, I do know that, but would it have been at that point? 
And so I need to look at the Quaker faith as well and see, because that's the only one that I can find that is in both places. So it gives me some ideas as how I've kind of debunked what was going on. I do not think she put her husband in a pickle barrel or a whiskey barrel, whichever it was. She was a small framed woman and you would not have done that because quite frankly, when you're on a ship coming over and you're a famine victim, you are not going to um, get rid of food or drink that's on board. So that just would not have happened. I do not believe she was married. I believe she came over. I believe at some point after coming over and prior to landing in North Carolina, that in that very small time window of like a year to two years that she, she became pregnant and had the child. So I believe this was probably a story that she made up because she had a child out of wedlock before she married, before she eventually married her husband here in North Carolina. So all of that, and if you've stuck with me, thank you so much, but you can kind of start to see, I think to, to let's wrap this up and let me kind of show you where I, I was going. With that. What I did was I really needed to understand if she was a female Irish immigrant coming to America, I needed to understand the female Irish immigrant. I didn't just need to understand Joanna. I needed to understand female Irish immigrant. Same thing for whatever ethnicity you are researching. This is kind of what you need to understand. You need to understand that group. So what I did is, um, and I've shown this before. I will um, put the link in just a second. This is Aaron's Daughters in America. It's by Hassia R. Diner. I got it on Amazon. And this is a book about Irish immigrant women in the 19th century in America. It talks about what who they were, what their life was like, this, the predominant characteristics in Ireland. The, it talks about that, those who were making the voyage, and it talks about what happened when they landed in America and how they went to find support and how they might have ended up in different places. So that's sort of where I'm at with the book. And it, so I really stopped looking at Joanna and I looked at her as a, a, a subgroup. I, look, I looked at her as, you know, an Irish female ancestor, or Irish female immigrant women coming over. That's important to do. I had to think about what were her motives. So what, what would be the motives of this crazy story about being married and your husband dying and you sticking him in a whiskey barrel? What would be a motive for something like that? Why would you come up with something like that? And it dawned on me that if indeed the true story is she came over, had a child out of wedlock, that's not very socially acceptable back in the 1850s. She probably, the story made more sense and was more socially acceptable for her. So that might have been it as well. And so that's part of what I'm looking at. And she also landed in an area that was not Irish, that was not Catholic. So that was kind of weird to me if she was indeed a Catholic, be, uh, of Catholic faith, because typically when the Irish um, women came over, they typically would end up, maybe they didn't stay in the port that they came in, but they would end up in the cities where they could work, where they could be uh, with people of their faith be, and other women, because that's how they got their support. That was their social networking system. So that's why I started picking apart that whole story and going, yeah, I don't think that's what happened. <laughs> All right. I know there've been some things over here in the chat. Let me check these real quick. So, Hey, Pam, Hey, Palmier. Um, oh, wait a minute. I, I missed there's something even higher up there. Catherine says she is too complicated right here, but she disproved half of the old family story and still working on the other half. I know it's really fun. And what I find sometimes when you start debunking the family stories, guys, be a little careful because people get a little sensitive when you start saying, yeah, that's not right. You know, um, there was, there were, um, at one point in my, when I was younger doing research, I couldn't tell some of my older aunts and uncles about what I'd found because it directly contradicted what they had believed all their life and they didn't want anything to do with it. So that was fine. That was perfectly fine. I just kept it you know, to myself and shared it with who wanted to hear it, but just be a little careful when you start debunking the family, the family history. Oh, sorry guys. Um, Pam said, oh, thank you. I'm glad you're enjoying it, Pam. I, I, I try to give what I can here. Um, hey, Debbie from Dallas, Oregon, um, and Teresa from South Carolina, wonderful. So Catherine, you had a question. You said if she was from Ulster, there were Presbyterians both there and 
in North Carolina, the Highland Scots in North Carolina were mostly Catholic. Yes, yes. Um, the reason I'm thinking, Catherine, that she was probably Quaker and that caught my attention is in the area where she ended up in North Carolina was a Quaker population and fairly strong. And so that's sort of what kind of piqued my interest in kind of pursuing to see if that was perhaps why she ended up there as well. Ultimately, she ended up in a just a um, independent, um, I don't think it was Baptist, but just an independent church there in, in Surrey County. So yeah. Should we document this type of story? Anna asked. She said, if you have only a word of mouth, very interesting. Yes, Anna, that is an absolutely wonderful question. I always document the story. Even as crazy as it is, I'm always going to document the story. Okay. But, you know, I always will indicate that this is an oral history, family oral history. I will try to, if I know who originated, if I know who told it to me, I will say, you know, as told by so and so to me, and I'll date it. And that way we know kind of which generation told it to me because you know, they will change over, versions will change over generations. So it just kind of puts a stake in the ground, so to speak. But I always want to retain the original. One, I think it's just interesting and it is part of who the family is. And two, it's kind of my place, my jumping off point for where to work, working from. So yeah, definitely go ahead and go ahead and keep it. Um, Cindy said, all the hoops that the women had to jump through, talk about being strong survivors. Yes, I happen to think Joanna was a very strong woman. I don't think she's somebody I would have wanted to have crossed based on some of what I get. Um, but she's just fascinating. I think one of the reasons I find her so fascinating is her story. One, as a kid, when I first heard it was so outrageous that I thought, this is really cool. This is cool stuff, right? And then the more I kept digging and everybody kept saying the same thing. And I thought, well, this is really odd that there's no variation in this story when it doesn't really make sense. And I can find no records to support any of this. Nothing, not a, at all. So um, I thought that was an interesting piece of the puzzle as well. So, yes, it's definitely interesting. Uh, Catherine says, Steve Morrison from either Oregon or Washington researches and speaks on Irish Quakers. Thank you, Catherine. I will have to check him out and research, reach out to him and see. Yeah, I could definitely use some help in that that arena on that. Oh, guys, and if you're looking for Irish, I use this too, is Tracing Your Irish Ancestors by John Granham. I'll pop that link in there too. And that's a really good Irish one as well. So Hazel says, she thinks, so true, sometimes think people are thinking about dates and forget about the background and logic. Yeah, we got to understand, they didn't just come over here just because that had to be a hard, I mean, that was a hard journey. Um, yeah, if my family was waiting for, you know, if my family history was waiting for me to cross the ocean to end up in America, we'd still be over in England. Trust me, I just was not going to happen um, with that. <laughs> Rosemary said, she says, we had several crazy stories in your past. One recently proved untrue through an old newspaper story you found online. Yeah, I know it's, I'm always excited when I find the truth and just a little bit heartbroken when I find the truth too, because yeah, it, it's and then when because the, when the story is no longer valid, it's it's just a, it's a piece of your family. It's a piece of who you are in a sense. And so, um, yeah, I'm, I think I think it's great. That's what wonderful resume that you found it. But I'm like, yeah, I'm just kind of like, OK, kind of break my heart a little bit. So anyway, so I want to encourage you when you have oral history, don't overlook it actively seek it out. And then what I would really encourage is sit back with it and, and think about it. Does it make sense? If you research long enough, you'll get what I call that genealogy gut. And that is the one that kind of sits with you when you find a record and you go, that's not, that's interesting, but there's something off. You, you just kind of get that sense that something's not quite right or that you don't have the full truth. And that's where, you know, you need to keep going. Okay. You need to keep going. You either need to prove it or you need to disprove it, but you just need to keep going with it. Part of Joanna's story that I didn't really share earlier is that 
while I'm still looking for exactly, I'm still looking for her arrival record, I was able to narrow it down to when she arrived in America. So I have been able to establish that she was here um, between 1850 and 1851. And yet her daughter was born in 1852. Trust me, the dates did not add up. And that was kind of the whole stickler with it. And, when the, and there's some other pieces of the puzzle as well. And there was records that her daughter who was born, I think out of wedlock on her marriage license or her marriage registration states the mother's name, my Joanna born in Ireland and the father is listed as unknown. Well, guess what? Joanna was still alive, very much alive during that time period. You would think she would have been able to fill that part in or have told her daughter or whatever, for whatever reason, but the father is listed as unknown. And that was kind of the, the linchpin that it's like, okay, what am I looking at here on that? Emma says, see, there was Newfoundland stories of folks being pickled in a, or, or in whiskey, someone who had died on the sea. If she was pregnant, there may have been an important value for saving her preserved husband when she lands in America. Just a thought. Okay, now, okay, Emma, now you've really turned my head on. I'm going to, I'm going to be looking that up. You know what I'll be spending the rest of my afternoon doing is looking that up. Oh my gracious. Okay, but that's good. Now I have new information I need to go look for. Thank you so much, Emma. Um, Maybe there was. I, I would be surprised. Things things still didn't add up, though. All right. I'm going to look it up. I'm going to find that out. So stay tuned for the story, guys. We just know. <laughs> Emma, don't be sorry at all. That's so funny. I'm just like, but I love getting stories like this out there. And you know, guys, this is actually brings up a good point. So I'll, I'll keep you a couple more minutes here. It brings up the point that when you sit down and you tell these stories to people, whether it's other researchers like yourselves, whether you sit down with other family members or, or just another group of people, when you talk through the stories and you try to dissect them, people have other knowledge, people have other perspectives that they can challenge you on, or they can say, hey, have you thought about this? And that is so valuable to your research. It's valuable in really determining accuracy and how much you can use those, that oral history, but any kind of record. Um, when you have another person that you need to explain your reasoning to, that is very valuable. They can bring a lot to the table by questioning you on things that you might not have seen before. Because if you are like me, you get so close and so deep into your research, it is hard to have to take that step back and get that perspective. So um, thank you, Emma. That's, you know, absolutely. It gives me another thought. And that's what I'm always looking for, particularly on Brickwall ancestors, because what's worse than not having a clue? <laughs> I'd much rather have um, somebody challenge, you know, my, my thinking than to not know, than to have no clue at all. So um, Catherine said, should we add our family stories we're working on into the Facebook group? Yeah, I'd love for you guys to do that. Um, yeah, pop your family stories into the Facebook group. Guys, if you're not a member of my Facebook group, let me um, grab you that link real quick. Um, and, we, you know, pop them in there and see what people say and see kind of what, um, if anybody has any extra information that might be helpful to you on your story. So, yeah, definitely. That's a great suggestion, Catherine. Let me just grab that link for you. If you are not a member of the Facebook group, just when you join, it will ask you a couple questions. You do need to answer the questions, guys, um, to get in. That's how I keep spam out. So make sure you answer at least one of the questions when you are at, when you're prompted to do so. And um, yeah, and, and then I'll let you in. It's no, no biggie there, but it does. Um, like I said, it keeps the spam. It keeps it helps me control the spam that way. So that's why I ask those questions when you ask to join the group. So thank you so much. All right, guys, I am going to real quick, I want to drop in those two resource books that I've been using because I think they might help some folks there. Um, so I'll pop those links in there. If you are watching on the replay on YouTube, sometimes it does not pull my comments over. I haven't figured out why or how to do that yet. So I will figure that out. But anyway, I'll have it down in the comments for you. Let me see, put that daughters. Here's the link to that Aaron's daughters over on Amazon. And here's the one for the 
Irish ancestors. And then I have to go. Apparently, I need to go look up. Um, <laughs> I need to go look up whiskey barrels and pickle barrels. Who do? And I will keep you guys posted on that. Okay. Next week, guys, I have a guest coming next week on. Let's see. So, yeah, that's leaky. I have a guest next week um, here with me. And we are going to be talking about, oh, um, virtual travel. And she's got some fabulous information, stuff I've never thought to do. And it's going to really play well into what we've talked about today and really moving that research needle, I think, forward, as well as allowing you to kind of walk where your ancestors walked, even if you can't be there. So she's going to be on with us next week. And ironically, we're talking about Irish ancestors. I did not plan that, I promise. Um, it just sort of happened to be what she her interest was in as well. So um, we'll be here for that. Let's see, somebody had a question. Dan said, how can I preserve? Oh, Dan said, you have old Billy Lee photos. How can you preserve them? Yes. Yeah, so I actually have a blog post on that about preserving old family photos. Let me grab that real quick, Dan, and I will um, I will pop that link in there for you. There's also, um, if you go back, let's see, preserving, can't spell. If you go back through the YouTube lives, I'll have to go back and look and see. There's one with Melissa Barker and Melissa is kind of my go-to person when it comes to um, preserving like old photos, anything. She is an archivist and a genealogist. So she, she's actually known as the archive lady. So I think that might, she would be, that would be one you definitely want to listen to. But in the meantime, I think, oh, no, oh, shoot. I'll find that. I'll find the link to that post afterwards, and I'll pop that in there for you, Dan. Don't worry. I'll, I'll grab that for you, so um, we can do that. All right, guys. I'm going to let you go ahead and go, and I will see you here next week. Bye.